Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to D News Plus again. I'm Amy, guest hosting for Trace all this week. This is episode two of five about NASA's Gemini program. Yesterday we talked about the origins of the Gemini program and where it fits in between the Mercury and Apollo programs and how it was really the bridge to the moon. Today we're gonna to talk about some of the early missions and specifically we're gonna look at how Gemini taught us how to live in space and work in space on long duration missions. Later episodes we're gonna be talking about spacewalks or EVAs, docking in space and of course splashdowns getting home safely so make sure you subscribe so that you get all of those episodes but for now let's dig into long duration spaceflight nasa's mercury program was the first to send astronauts into space but they didn't go for very long the first two missions were actually suborbital flights just 15 minute up and down pop gun shots the later missions did go into orbit but they still didn't last very long the longest was the last mission called faith 7 and astronaut gordon cooper went up for about 34 hours it's going to take longer than a day to get to the moon. So by the time Cooper flies in 1963, NASA's already well into planning to get to the moon. Missions to the moon are going to take about 14 days, or at most 14 days. So this NASA comes up with this number because it takes about three days to go to the moon. You want to go to the moon and actually spend some time there. You want to do some science in orbit before you land. You want to land, you want to take a day or two as much as you can exploring the moon's surface, get back up into orbit, orbit the moon, do some more reconnaissance, take pictures, maps, and then the three-day journey back. So NASA figured that it would be roughly 14 days would be the safe estimate of how long it would have to learn to keep men alive in space, in a spacecraft, to go to the moon. So this was one of the main goals of the Gemini program, was to figure out how to keep men alive and healthy and happy, as happy as they could be. Um, over a two a two week long mission. And as we get into discussing duration, it's probably worth mentioning that the uh, habitable volume of the Gemini spacecraft is about the size of the front seat of a Volkswagen Beetle. So imagine being stuck in the front seat of a car with everything that you need to survive for two full weeks, and that includes your bathroom, with someone who is maybe not your best friend, but a good acquaintance for two weeks and you can't roll down the window or step outside at all. Get yourself in that mentality as we discuss long duration flights. So because the Mercury missions, backtracking a bit, because the Mercury missions were so short, um, the spacecraft was actually powered by batteries. It didn't need to last any longer than could be powered by batteries. Um, and the first Gemini missions were also powered by batteries. Uh, Gemini 1 and Gemini 2 were both unmanned flights. Gemini 1 was just a test of the launch vehicle and Gemini 2 was a test of the heat shield. Gemini 3 was the first um, manned mission. It was a shakedown cruise, as they call it, um, just a chance for two astronauts. They went up, did one orbit, came back down to make sure that everything worked perfectly. Uh, and it did. It was a very successful mission. Uh, Gemini 3 is actually famous for being the time that a corned beef sandwich went up into space and the crew uh, snuck it on board. Um, John Young, the, the pilot, snuck it on board for Commander Gus Grissom, who took a bite and then crumbs went everywhere and he said this was a bad idea and then put it back in his leg pocket. Um, and the how they managed to smuggle a sandwich on board remains a bit of a mystery. But uh, So that was really the most noteworthy thing about about Gemini 3. The, everything on board the spacecraft worked fine. It was a great new vehicle. Gemini 4 also used batteries because it was a short duration mission. Although we will get into more detail on what Gemini 4 did in a later episode because some of you may know it is rather an historic mission. Gemini 5 was NASA's first long duration mission. It was slated to last eight days in space. So not quite the full 14, but getting up there in days. To live in space for eight days without just a huge spacecraft that was all batteries, NASA had to develop a new technology, and this new technology was the fuel cell. Fuel cells use an electrochemical reaction combining cryogenic hydrogen and oxygen to produce electricity, heat, and potable water as byproducts. So this is a pretty great system to have on board a spacecraft because you have these two gases in tanks, you have oxygen for your atmosphere and also combine it with hydrogen to make power and water and that you can drink and use to wash yourself, not that they really washed much in that thing, um, and also rehydrate your food um, and heat. So this is a great system to use and this is what NASA developed to go to the moon to keep a crew of three alive for 14 days going to the moon. But it was up to Gemini 5 to figure out how just, you know, put them through their paces and make sure that these fuel cells would actually work. So Gemini 5 launched in 1965 with fuel cells on board and the crew um, 
this is one of the first ever mission patches that NASA kind of had an issue with. The the mission patch for this this mission was a covered wagon to kind of call to you know a long crossing across America in pioneer times. And um, under a little piece of white fabric, it said eight days or bust. So the crew was pretty determined um, that it was going to make they were going to stay up there for eight days no matter what happened. The crew on this flight was Gordon Cooper, who had, at this point, the longest Mercury mission under his belt, and Pete Conrad, who some of you may know I named my cat after. The mission launched, and everything sort of looked good going into launch, but there was a problem with the fuel cell fairly early on in the mission that actually forced the crew to power down a lot of their system just to get to that eight day duration. And Pete Conrad, I named my cat after him because he's a bit of a character. He mentioned after the flight in his memoirs and sort of in interviews afterwards that he said he got so bored and had talked to Gordon Cooper about everything he could imagine during training that they were sitting there orbiting the earth in the front seat of a car with nothing to talk about that all he wished was that he had a book to pass some of the time with. Just imagine being up, someone that you don't really want to talk to necessarily for really for eight solid days with nothing to do. Uh, what Gemini 5 really did do was take a lot of pictures in all of their downtime because they had they were really just riding at the clock. But they did it. They made the eight days um, and proved that fuel cells uh, had some kinks to be worked out in them, but were ultimately a technology that was on its way to becoming ready for the Apollo program. So as we get into long duration missions, there's also the basic human question that I always ask myself, and I feel like you guys are probably asking yourself, how do you do things like eat and go to the bathroom when you're stuck in space for days at a time? The food on the Gemini program wasn't exactly appetizing. A lot of it was freeze dried or um, dehydrated food that they could add some of that that water as the lovely byproduct of the fuel cells too, to, to reconstitute it and eat it. Going to the bathroom was a bit of a different matter. Um, the, the astronauts were all on what they called low residue diets, and this was effectively a diet that would um, have you pass as little stool as possible. Um, but if you did have to pass stool, it was a uh, very scientific procedure of sticking a bag to your buttocks uh, using the facility and then sealing it up and there was a, um, sort of a, a material inside the bag that you could kind of squish it <laughs> and it would uh, neutralize the odor and freeze the waste but there was no way to dump it overboard so they would just have to store it which is really an unappetizing uh, prospect as I'm sure you can imagine so Gemini Gemini 5 they could kind of handle it for the eight days Gemini 7 had a bit of a worse go of it. Gemini 7 was NASA's long duration mission of the Gemini program, and this was the 14 day trial. The astronauts on board this mission were Frank Borman and Jim Lovell, who may be familiar to some of you guys from the movie Apollo 13. T Tom Hanks played Jim Lovell. This was the mission where they just had to really ride it out for the seven days. And I, I think that Pete Conrad told the crew to bring books just in case they got bored. And this is also the mission where even with the low residue diets, I think it was like day eight, I remember hearing a story from Jim Lovell that uh, Frank Borman kind of cracked and said that he, he had to crack open one of the uh, fecal containment units. So that was the first time that happened, I believe, <laughs> um, which apparently was just absolutely awful. Um, Gemini 7 did make it the full 14 days. Their fuel cells worked. They were able to run all experiments, and they actually did a really interesting docking, a uh, rendezvous, rather, um, maneuver that we'll talk about in a later episode. Um, but just, it was one of those things, two guys sitting in space for 14 days when they splashed down and the, um, the Navy divers that got them out of the spacecraft opened the door, and the comment was, it really just smells like a latrine. That's just the visual that I can leave you with when discussing long duration spaceflight. So between Gemini 5 and Gemini 7, NASA did figure out the long duration goal. Gemini 7 was the 14 days. The later missions that came after it didn't have to be as long because this goal was met with Gemini 7. And the missions were longer than one or two orbits, but they didn't have to be 14 days. So with Gemini 7, NASA knew that it had the power and the technology to send astronauts on a 14 day mission, it had the resources to do it. But now the next question that we're gonna tackle in this series on the Gemini program is what the astronauts would do when they actually got to the moon. Not only were they going to get out and walk around the moon on the surface outside the safety of the spacecraft, they might have to transfer between two vehicles using a spacewalk and that's another goal that the Gemini program achieved. So tomorrow we're gonna to get into more details on that. We'll talk spacesuits and some kind of terrifying near-death experiences. So make sure you subscribe 
subscribe to get all that. So let me know in the comments below, how do you think you would survive an extended mission in space with your very best acquaintance in the front seat of a car with no way to dump your waste? interesting thought. <laughs> if you want to watch more about space right now, Trace and Ian did a whole series on black holes, or you can see more of me over at my channel, Vintage Space. Thanks for watching, you guys. Subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.